Good evening, everyone. I'm Gretchen Crosby Sims, the executive director here at the Institute of Politics. And it is a pleasure to welcome Stephen Greenhouse and Sarah Nelson to campus this evening. We look forward to their conversation with Noam Scheiber. Stephen Greenhouse is a former IOP Pritzker fellow. Thank you for returning to campus. Um, and in the hall after our conversation, you can buy his new book, Beaten Down, Worked Up, The Past, Present, and Future of American Labor. He'll be signing copies after the program. I do want to mention a few upcoming events. We have a very busy week this week and next. Um, on Thursday this week, Rick Santorum and Bill Crystal will be discussing um, in a friendly debate <laughs> the future of the um, Republican Party. <laughs> IOP Pritzker fellow um, Margaret Hoover will moderate that conversation. In two weeks, on March 9th, we will host Kelly Magsiman and Benham Bell Talblu for a conversation on the long-term relationship between the US and Iran. On March 10th, Peter Baker, the Chief White House Correspondent for the New York Times, will moderate a panel discussion on the impact of impeachment um, and if there will be an impact at all. As always, information about our upcoming events can be found on our website at politics.uchicago.edu. We will have questions after um, the conversation. We'll have a microphone in the center aisle so that you can ask your questions. We reserve the first three questions for students. We remind you that questions end in question marks. Please also make sure <laughs> that your phones are on silent. A lot of laughs tonight. Um, the restroom staff are downstairs if you need them. And now to formally introduce our speakers is Natalie Chapin. Natalie is a second year from El Cerrito, California, studying public policy and sociology. During her time at the IOP, she has been a voting ambassador for our nonpartisan voter engagement effort, Ushai Votes. This year, she is the um, co-chair of the Chicago-style student-led event committee. Natalie, the podium is yours to tell everybody a little bit more about our guests. Historically, trade unions have protected the rights and labor conditions of otherwise disadvantaged workers for over a century. But the current state of the labor movement seems to be in turmoil if the Chicago Teachers Union strike and local graduate student union strikes serve as any indication. We welcome Sarah Nelson, Stephen Greenhouse, and Noam Scheiber to discuss the future of the labor movement. Sarah Nelson's time as a flight attendant led her to become national communications chair at the United Airlines chapter, as well as national strike chair. When the United Airlines corporate bankruptcy ended the pension plan for flight attendants, Nelson responded by announcing an intent to strike. She has since used her organizing skills to make traveling safer and secure longer minimum rest times for flight attendants. Nelson is now the international president of the Association of Flight Attendants, CWA, and led the labor movement through strikes in the face of the government shutdown in 2019. Stephen Greenhouse spent 31 years at the New York Times as a labor and workplace correspondent. He has covered many prominent trade, unions and trade union strikes and drives, including the New York Transit strike and the UPS strike. His book, Beaten Down, Worked Up, the past, present, and future of American labor tells the stories of a century of worker strikes and the personal experiences of American laborers while offering hope for the future in well thought out suggestions. In spring 2017, he was a resident Pritzker fellow at the IOP. Our moderator, Noam Scheiber, is a Chicago-based reporter for the New York Times where he writes about all kinds of workers and their roles in the US economy. He is a Rhodes Scholar and former senior editor of The New Republic, where he covered economic policy as well as presidential campaigns. Please welcome Sarah Nelson, Stephen Greenhouse, and Noam Scheiber. Um, so thanks, everybody, for joining us. We're really excited to be here. Um, these are two um, first-rate thinkers about the state of American labor. Um, <laughs> So Steve, before um, we get into um, the discussion proper, um, I thought it might just be helpful to hear from you about what motivated this book. You've been covering the topic for a long time, but a book is a real heave, as we say at the Times. Why, uh, why did you decide to write this? First, it's great to be at this event for the IRP. The IRP does wonderful stuff uh, you know, for Chicago, for the university, for advancing political, economic, social discussions. Thank you, Gretchen. Uh, thanks, David Axelrod. So why did I write this book? So you know. This, you know, I'm being asked this by my successor as labor workplace correspondent for the New York Times. Um, so I covered labor workplace matters for 19 years. 
and you're like uh, you know, a little kid you know, whose nose is a, up against a big aquarium, you know, looking closely at it day after day, and you see certain things that maybe other people don't pay enough attention to. And covering labor, I saw that during the 19 years, just you know, labor unions and worker power overall in the US were getting weaker and weaker and weaker. And to me, that was an important phenomenon. And I thought that notion was not getting nearly enough attention. You know, we, you know, we hear about corporate profits reaching record levels and the stock market reaching record levels. And there isn't nearly enough focus examination on why are wages stagnating so much? You know, what is the relationship between the decline in worker power and increased income inequality? I was a reporter for the New York Times in Paris for five years. And you know, everyone in France gets six weeks paid vacation. Uh, and gets you know, paid sick days and, and paid parental leave. And, and I realize the United States is the only industrial nation that doesn't guarantee its workers any paid vacation or any, you know, any paid parental leave. And, and only we in South Korea are the, we're the only two industrial nations that don't guarantee paid sick days. So, and I also saw things getting worse about you know, when, when I was young, um, unpaid internships were very, very rare. They become hugely more popular as corporations take advantage. And, and again, you know, years ago, there were very few non-compete clauses. Corporations make, you know, 30% of workers have to sign non-compete clauses. 60% have to sign, you know, forced arbitration. So things are getting worse and worse for workers in many ways, even as some people trumpet that, trumpet that things have been made great again. So I just tried to explain <laughs> that Unfortunately, things are getting worse for workers, and a, and a root cause of that is that worker power has grown weaker. So um, toward the end of your book, you uh, identify certain countervailing trends. Uh, so s still the case that you know, um, labor union density is declining, and we have this whole variety of institutional arrangements that you describe that are undermining worker power at the same time we have this real um, mobilization of workers over the past three, four, five years. Um, strike activity is as high as it's been in several decades. Um, I guess I'd like to ask each of you um, what you think is going on here. Why are we seeing this sort of bubbling up of worker energy? And relatedly, whether you think the labor movement as it exists today is prepared to capitalize on that, or whether we need something else to you know, replace it in order to be able to capitalize on that. Sarah. Wow. Um, well, uh, it's exciting to be in Chicago, actually, because um, a great example of what's going on um, happened right here with the Chicago teacher strike. And um, this is about really the fact that um, in this country, workers have been taught to believe that individual exceptionalism, exceptionalism is um, the standard. And that, you know, if you don't like a job, you should just go get a job somewhere else. And that if someone else is doing better uh, than you are, then you should pull them down rather than extending your hand and having them help you up. And um, that has not worked. Um, we, we saw in the United Airlines the bankruptcy that was referenced earlier um, that what happened was there was an over three-year bankruptcy where... Uh, the corporation really used that bankruptcy not just to restructure, but to really um, take away these things that had been long believed to be a part of our society. So at the beginning of the bankruptcy, uh, we were meeting with the other unions, for example, and um, we said, oh gosh, in a bankruptcy, they can take your pensions away. And at the time, I remember some of the uh, pilot representatives said, oh, they'll never do that. that pensions are a sacred cow in this country. And when the Bush White House couldn't um, get through its plan to privatize Social Security, the guns really turned on the defined benefit pension plans. And sure enough, here we are um, with one of the biggest looming disasters, the, the collapse of the multi-employer pension plans and the destruction of all of these other pension plans. And so workers in this country who have even built good union jobs are seeing either through mergers or bankruptcies, you know, consolidation, um, consolidated power of corporations, the really the downward pressure on these good jobs that have been built up through the unions, and then as union density has declined, there's more and more people who don't have any union protections at all, and are working two and three jobs. Um, unite here with the slogan "One job should be enough." Um, to me. You know, I wish it were back to, uh, we should have bread and roses too, but God, if we could just have one job that it's enough, uh, wouldn't that be great? 
Um, people are feeling a real solidarity um, about what they're experiencing because there's no retirement security. Um, even if you have a union healthcare plan, um, you see your friends and neighbor and family members suffering from that. If you're a GM striker, you can tell very well how the company can weaponize healthcare against you. Um, you um, every time you go to the table, you've got, you see healthcare diminishing, you've got to fight for the plan that you negotiated decades ago just to keep. Um, and the for-profit company running away with tons of money. Um, you see people who can't control their schedules, and the schedules are being controlled by corporations in order to keep people um, beholden to the corporation, but also to diminish their benefits. And then staffing has been cut to the uh, bare minimum. And what I'm describing right here, any flight attendant who's in the room can identify with this, but so could anyone from any other industry. And so could the Chicago teachers who said, you know what, we have to actually reach out. We have to bargain for the common good. Um, we have to show the community that lifting up these jobs is also about lifting up the community and lifting up the people in the community. And what's extraordinary is they were out there on strike um, to make sure that there could be access to school nurses. This may be the difference for a family who does, has no idea where, why a kid is failing. And it took a school nurse to say that they're having a hard time hearing. And a hearing aid is going to make all the difference in the opportunities for this kid. And they stood out there with SEIU and these low-wage worker jobs and said, we're standing out here together and going to lift the standards. And, and tens of thousands of workers and families' jobs were lifted up with them. And so it's a real microcosm for what I think is happening all across America and that there is this feeling of solidarity. This next generation understands that nobody did it for them. They're gonna to have to do it for themselves, and they're more prone to collective action and, and wanting to lift, lift things up. And so I, I really think that what we can do is we can re-energize the central institution, the AFL-CIO. We've got an incredible structure. Uh, 13 million people in the labor movement is nothing to sneeze at. And um, if we can really energize that and use the power of the workers who are already in our unions to organize hundreds of millions more who are ready to be organized according to all the surveys, um, then we can really have worker power to change the politics and change the laws. Now, um, Stephen has great ideas about how we need to change the policies in order to be able to do that, and the two go hand in hand. But workers are ready to take this on, and I think that's what we're seeing in our politics, which we'll get to a little bit later. So I don't think that we have to replace what we have. I think that we have to re-energize and welcome everyone to it, and a big, big part of that is helping people understand that the labor movement is for every working person. It is not uh, the way that um, you know, people are defining the labor movement from central casting with a, a lunch pail. It is, it is um, people of color, it is women, uh, it is anyone who has a job is part of the labor movement. And I should just take a quick moment to say that it is also the student library workers right here at the University of Chicago who had to fight for two and a half years to get uh, recognition for their union right here and now are finally going to get to the bargaining table. Um, so congratulations to Teamsters Local 743. But that's what's happening all across the country is that people are understanding that actually if you fight, you can win. And if you stand together, you can lift each other up. So Steve, I just want to refine the question a tiny bit because Sarah, Sarah alluded to a couple <laughs> of themes there that I thought you might be able to riff on. They appear throughout your book. Um, inequality. Um, it just seems like you know one of the one of the uh, answers to the question of why now is um, we've just gotten to this point where the, the inequality, economic, political, uh, political power inequality is um, is sort of inescapable, and it seems like that we may have, have reached a t tipping point that's sort of um, you know infusing this this new uh, this new energy from uh, rank and file workers, and two. Uh, which Sarah also alluded to is um, generational change. It just, uh, if you look at the surveys, um, young people just seem overwhelmingly um, uh, energetic about the idea of organizing in a way that uh, earlier generations didn't. So, uh, so I'm often asked, you know, how is organized labor doing? How are workers doing? And I say, on one hand, you look at the statistics about the percentage of workers in unions that's gone from you know 35 percent peak in the 1950s to just 10. Now, so that's down. 
and on a certain level, well, things ain't good there. But as, you know, as Sarah said, as you said, there's a lot of energy now. There's a lot of you know, a lot of workers like fed up about wage stagnation, about income inequality, about you know, again, they see the stock market doing so well, and they say, but I'm not seeing that in my paycheck. And and in ways, the ball, the recent ball got rolling with West Virginia, where the teachers, you know, like four or five years in a row, they hadn't gotten raises. The governor, uh, Governor Justice, the richest person in West Virginia, <laughs> announces one day, I'm going to I'm going to be generous. I'm going to give you one percent raise each year for five years, and they're already 48th lowest in in, in pay among teachers, forty-four thousand dollar a year average. One percent raises for like four hundred dollars. And, and they realized that their health care premiums would probably rise more than this $400. So, you know, these, these two young teachers, Jay O'Neill and Emily Comer, an English teacher, Spanish teacher, basically say, screw this, we're going to do something about it. And, and, you know, at the same time, the Republican legislature was giving big tax cuts to corporations and to the rich and for fracking. And the teacher said, something's really broken here. I mean, it's, it's partly inequality. It's partly that the education budget is, has been frozen year after year. Class sizes are going up. And people felt beaten down and worked up, so to speak. And and you know these two That's young slogan, by the yes, you know these <laughs> the, these two young people began this Facebook page, and it you know rocketed to 20,000, 30,000 people. And and you know I, uh, and you know that strike, which learned a lot, and the people who led the strike in West Virginia studied up on the so, Chicago yeah. teacher strike years earlier, and and Chicago played a very big role in in teaching these other teachers, but. West Virginia really got their ball rolling recently, and then you know this teacher in Oklahoma, Alberto Marjan, a social studies teacher, was watching on TV and said, "Look what they're doing in West Virginia. We can do that." So he started the Facebook page, and then you know in Arizona, these amazing strikes, which were in ways fights against income inequality, because in all three states there were tax cuts for the rich and for corporations and for fracking, believe it or not, and and the teachers resented that you know these tax cuts were going to the one percent, two percent, while the schools were were being um, squeezed badly. And, and these strikes really got the ball rolling, I think, for the General Motors strike, which would, there was also the sense that you know, General Motors has $38 billion in North American profits, if, my, if memory serves. Well, um, there, was a two, you know, there were two-tier wages for, for these workers who had helped rescue GM from bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And the workers felt, we bent over backwards to save GM, and they're not reciprocating in kind. And I think they've, they've shared the sentiment with the teacher strikers and with the Marriott strikers that the economy is doing so well. You know, we hear that, that everything is great again, but, you know, and that we're 10 years, 11 years into this economic recovery, and we don't feel we've gotten our fair share. And, and the hotel workers, you know, you know, they're getting 1, 2, and 3% raises, but rents are going up 20 and 30% in San Diego and, and San Francisco and San Jose. So a lot of workers are just fed up, and as Sarah said, they realize that you know, only through collective action can they really make a difference. And, and I think you know, one of the reasons Donald Trump was elected was many workers, many blue collar workers, felt the system is rigged. And I think a reason there's this you know, res you know, resurgence of popularity of unions now is a lot of people think, well, one way to solve this rigging is to turn to labor. And we are, you know, another very promising thing for labor now is we're seeing all these adjunct professors unionized like wildfire across the nation. We're seeing all these people in our, in our field, digital media. The two most anti-union newspapers in the, in the country have unionized recently, the Chicago Tribune and the LA Times. We've seen a lot of grad students unionizing here and elsewhere. And, and you know, as a reporter, I'm not supposed to sound opinionated, but I say, how could, how could a university administration deny that the teaching done by graduate teaching assistants is not work? I mean, that's just absurd to me. <laughs> and, and, and we're seeing a lot of other labor activity. Uh, uh, local in New York City has unionized 15,000 airport workers, baggage handlers, wheelchair pushers. The Teamsters have organized 50,000 school bus drivers around the nation. Uh, Noam just did a terrific article about you know, Google and, and how workers there are getting worked up. Uh, and and uh, you know, Kickstarter was the first well-known tech company to just unionize. So people, workers are frustrated, and they want answers. And, and they don't feel they're getting answers from the federal government right now. So they're trying to take power into their own hands in the form of collective action. And they're trying to press their employers to give them a fairer deal, a new deal, a better deal. 
So um, we're reluctant to get into this topic because it's probably not of interest to most of you, but <laughs> given that the 2020 campaign looms over a lot of this conversation, we figured we'd, we'd kind of grudgingly um, do a few minutes about that. And I, I guess the, um, the question I have about 2020 is, um, how much of this energy that you guys have been talking about that's bubbling up from workers and workplaces, how much of that is trickling into the 2020 campaign? How much do we see it play out in some of these primaries that we've already seen? And um, to what extent do you think that one of the major party candidates for president, or both of them, um, can harness this in, um, in the general election campaign in 2020? Uh, well, um, I think what's extraordinary is I was talking with a union organizer a couple weeks ago who said, you know, I, I would organize under any one of the labor plans of any of the Democratic uh, candidates for president. And those labor plans didn't just happen because they thought it would be a good thing to do. They happened because of the strikes that are happening, the energy that's happening around the country. Uh, the way uh, to win this election is to bring new people out to the polls and to energize the electorate. And the candidates get that. But I think that what the candidates also get is that um, we had over 400,000 people who got essentially immediate results. Now, the unions were working on building toward those strikes for a very long time. There's a lot of, I don't, I don't want to over romanticize that because there's a lot of work that goes on behind that um, to make that successful. But when, but people are seeing that workers are taking collective action together and in some cases getting a result in a day or getting a result within a couple of weeks or even six weeks. And when was the last time that you got anything done with the government in that amount of time? So these candidates standing on picket lines and standing with unions are saying, I'm somebody who's gonna get something done. That's the other thing that they're saying here. And that's why it's so incredibly important that they're a part of that. Um, because um, they want to be seen as the candidate who is going to fix things. Um, I was talking with Reverend Barber um, about being in Kentucky before the governor's election there. And the Poor People's Campaign spent time in three uh, districts in, in Kentucky that had gone over 80% for Trump. And these, these districts changed and went blue in this election. And um, he was there talking with um, a guy with the last name McCoy. He was actually a real McCoy. <laughs> and, um, you know, he said, he said uh, yeah, um, pardon me here, but I'm going to use his exact language. He said, yeah, we know Trump is shit. But he came here. And then his staff came back. And they came back again. And we haven't seen a Democrat since LBJ. And so when you're hurting, and you have nowhere to turn, and you have nothing left, when somebody will talk to you, then you're going to give them a chance to tell them your story. And, and so I think that um, there is a real recognition by the candidates in this election that to be connected to working people and what working people are feeling out there that are working more than one job, who are, can't even be defined as employees to be able to organize and get ahead, who have to actually conduct an illegal strike in West Virginia together to make, uh, make the conditions change, um, that the candidates are seeing that the only way to energize the kind of turnout in this election to have a different outcome than the last outcome where people said, we're willing to try anything because nothing else has worked, um, they're going to have to be tight with labor and tight with working people. So picking up on that, so I, I think, so I think a lot of the candidates realize that a reason, a big reason Hillary Clinton lost was she didn't focus enough on fighting for workers. And Donald Trump, you know, whatever you want to say about him, he really tried targeting, focusing on blue collar workers, saying, I'm your guy, I'm a blue collar billionaire, I'm going to bring back all the jobs, no, fa you know, no factories will close on my watch. And a lot of people believed him, and even many workers who didn't believe him thought, at least he's focusing on our issues, at least he cares. And Hillary maybe didn't care so much about their issues, and maybe John Kerry didn't, and maybe Al Gore didn't, and maybe Mike Dukakis didn't. So I think the this year's crop of Democrat candidates say, you know, one great way for us to increase our chances of winning in November is pay attention to workers. And, and uh, you know, Joan Williams, this law professor at UC Hastings, wrote this very smart book saying, um, you know, 
you know, under FDR, there was this wonderful democratic coalition of you know, workers and, and educated people and African Americans. But the Democratic Party, she said, nowadays is increasingly the party of the professional class. Lawyers, doctors, investment bankers, Hollywood folks. And, and she says it has to return to its FDR roots. And I think, you know, you know Bernie, you know, all, all the, as, as, as Sarah said, you know, Bernie, Elizabeth, Cory Booker, Beto, Beto O'Rourke, uh, Joe Biden, uh, and, and uh, Joaquin Castro, I mean, they, they all put out terrific labor platforms, you know, much better than, you know, any, any previous Democrats. And, and, and I think they see that, you know, to reduce, you know, to increase wages, to fight income inequality, we need stronger unions. But I think another thing they see, and I explain this in my book, is so, you know, as many of you uh, know, in the neighboring state, Wisconsin, Scott Walker pushed through this law in 2011 to cripple public sector unions. And what many people don't understand is, uh, appreciate is that since that law was passed, union membership in Wisconsin has fallen at a faster rate than in any other state, 44%. It's fallen by 177,000 in the past decade. 177,000 union members lost. Donald Trump won Wisconsin by 22,700 votes. Uh, Michigan, under Republican Rick Snyder, passed a, a right to work law and several other anti-union laws. Michigan has lost 144,000 union members over the last decade. And, and um, Trump won Wisconsin, Wisconsin, Michigan by 10,700 votes. Mm -hmm. you know, there's a terrific study done by some professors at Boston University and Columbia University saying that in states where right to work laws are enacted, laws that mean that you know, people at unionized workplaces can stop contributing any money whatsoever to the union that bargains for them and wins raises for them, that when states pass right to work laws, the Democratic vote share drops by 3.5%. Trump won Michigan, which has a right to work law, by 0.2%. Wisconsin has a right to work law. Trump won Wisconsin by 0.8%. So the Republicans get that if a good way to increase one's chances of winning is to you know, try to gut the labor movement, and they think the Democrats are realizing that hey, maybe the Republicans are doing something smart and we should really try to undo that. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to um, press uh, on, on um, one uh, subtext here. I think um, often, um, like in, in your responses, you sort of frame this as uh, the Democratic Party, the Democratic establishment being a little slow to realize <laughs> that um, its long-term interest was very much aligned with workers and with unions. But I think there's another, and, and that's, they're now slowly waking up to that fact. Um, and there is the campaign contributor factor, yeah. Right, but, but I think there's another split, um, which we may have seen a little bit already in this campaign, um, and we saw some in 2016, which is um, sort of um, labor leadership, labor establishments, and then rank and file workers. And often their um, political interests aren't totally aligned. So in 2016, 2015, we had a lot of unions that were very, very early to endorse Hillary. And um, it turned out later on, as that cycle played out, uh, a lot of rank and file workers were very pro-Bernie. Um, and you know, we can debate endlessly about you know, how much those union polls, unions polled their members and who, you know, how big the support was for Bernie as a practical matter. But in retrospect, it was clear that there was like real grassroots energy for Bernie. And I think that energy was underappreciated by a lot of union leaders. And I think this time, too, um, you know, much has been made about Joe Biden's appeal to union members and to unions, um, but it, it seems like we're sort of, um, this is playing out again. You know, that Bernie, uh, if, you know, we look at Nevada, for example, ha has really captured the minds of a lot of rank and file union members, mm -hmm. but the establishment is still kind of queasy <laughs> um, to go where their members suggest they want them to go. What, what do you make? Am I overstating the split, or is that a real thing? Um no, that's a real thing, but I think that what we should recognize is that many of the union leaders who were deciding to lead their unions to endorsements in 2016 um, had done union work in a world where uh, the relationships mattered, where there was this idea that we had this uh, labor peace with labor management relations. Um, and you know, as Mother Jones told us a century ago, uh, she said, you will fight and win, you will fight and lose, but you must fight. And there's, there's something to that, because if you, have, if you have a union, you have a legal institution where people are brought together basically against their will, their only commonality is their employer, right? But you've got all these different, um, 
all these different uh, ideas and beliefs coming into one workplace. And the only thing that really brings them together is their common issues at work. And that only happens if the union is bringing them together around those common, common issues and fighting on those issues. And what we saw was decades of um, let's have you know peaceful labor relations, let's move to, oh, and let's also de, um, deny workers the right to strike. Um, let's you know take it right to the heart of the strike with the firing of all the PATCO strikers, for example, um, right from the President of the United States. So um, attacking labor law, uh, attacking unions' rights, trying to get rid of unions through bankruptcies and consolidations too, um, and, and just an outright assault on unions led union leaders to a place of um, feeling like um, the, it was very difficult to fight. And so the best that they could really do was to create relationships where they can try to get some, the best possible deal um, in, the, in, the, uh, in that scenario. And so what happened in 2016 was that, was that was the result of decades of this happening and feeling like they needed to um, get behind the candidate who was most likely to win and most likely to help them with um, hopefully some labor law that would be helpful for their members. So I think it was all coming from a good place. What was missing there was that people had been squeezed so hard, and you know, kudos to Stephen for writing his book. You gotta think about this. He wrote it ahead of time. Like it came out at just the right time, like he's right with the times, but he was actually ahead of the time because you have to start this before, long before <laughs> um, it's actually published. But um, people have had enough, and they've been squeezed so far that they're ready to fight. People are ready to fight, and they're looking for answers. And um, the labor movement actually has it for them. There's um, workers out in, um, I, I read this article recently, there's workers out in Portland, Oregon, a young worker who had to Google the word union because she was looking for an answer in her workplace, had to actually Google the word union. And then another worker in a similar workspace, in a tech workspace, who heard that she had a union organizer neighbor who lived near her, and she went and knocked on her neighbor's door. She actually did a house call to the union organizer um, to say, <laughs> can you tell me about the union? Um, and so people are ready to fight, and they're looking for answers, and they're looking for these unions. And I think that's what you're seeing a convergence of in this political moment in 2020. And But what you're also seeing is unions recognizing, for the most part, that they need to leave those endorsements um, to the locals and to the rank and files. And you're not seeing a lot of endorsements this year because it's not about the endorsements, it's about the votes. And it's about turning out the votes. And if people hear their issues, then they're going to come out and vote. So trying to lift up the issues and get the candidates talking about those issues that union members care about and workers care about is what unions are focused on now in order to have a different result in this election. Because Sarah's right, and just to reframe it for a second. So I think you know, four years ago when you know, Hillary Clinton very assiduously courted four of the largest, most important unions in the nation, the American Federation of Teachers, the National Education Association, the American Federation of State County Municipal Employees, and the Service Employees International Union. And those account for probably three, two thirds, three quarters of the nation's union members. And she you know, had very close personal relationships with them and they endorsed her maybe earlier than they realized they should have. Um, and now I think there's a reaction, well, we might have been too quick to endorse four years ago, and now we have to be more careful because we got so much grief for endorsing early. And now I think they're in a quandary because I think a lot of union members support Bernie, uh, a lot support Elizabeth Warren, a lot supported, uh, you know, support Joe Biden. You know, his, you know, I think his union support is declining as his public support is declining. A lot supported, supported Castro, a lot supported Booker. So it's... So I think you know, for you know, even the culinary union in Las Vegas, I, I, you know, I saw a poll saying 34, you know, exit poll, 34% of union members supported Bernie. So if only 34% support Bernie, you're not going to say, well, we, we should endorse him because 66% don't. So I think union leaders are being more careful. And if they were really extremely confident that this person would be the winner, and, and they want to shorten the, you know, all the the Sturm and Drang, then they might pick a winner. Uh, but as they did with Al Gore early on against Bill Bradley in, back in 2000. But I think now they're being very careful. Um, we have a few minutes before we open <laughs> up to questions. Um, so before we do that, I thought um, we should um, do one thing that you do toward the end of your book, which is um, discuss some concrete reform ideas that um, if there is, well, 
if there is a Republican president or a Democratic president, either one could uh, enact them or help enact them, but um, <laughs> probably more likely that we'd see them from a Democratic president. Um, if you're just kind of looking across the range of options, um, the reforms that would give you the highest, you know, the greatest bang for your buck, what, what would the two or three of those, those be? Just changing labor law. So, so yeah. Just very quickly. So, yeah, people don't realize that the playing field when you try to unionize, you know, it's become clear in your Google, is very tilted against workers and unions and very tilted in favor of corporations. You know, corporations can show video 24-7 24, 24 in lunchrooms, in, in break rooms, and union organizers can be pr absolutely prohibited from setting foot on company property. So I, I would try to create a more even playing field, let union organizers you know, give them access to the lunchroom or give them access to talk. Uh, you know, a lot of corporations break the law and fire people illegally for supporting a union. They cannot be fined for that under current law. The penalties are extremely small. They could try to increase that. But uh, it would be hard you know, for that to, you know, to win passage unless the Democrats have at least 60 seats in the Senate. An idea I favor strongly because it might help change the conversation is I, I've long liked co-determination in Germany where workers elect just under 50% of the members of corporate supervisory boards. Tammy Baldwin of Wisconsin proposed getting, letting workers elect 33%. Someone named Elizabeth Warren proposed letting workers elect 40%. You know, Bernie's saying now let, let uh, workers own or 20% of corporate shares. So I think it's important to give workers more ownership and more voice within companies. Sarah, as someone who actually has responsibility for organizing workers. What would, be mo what would be the one or two tools that would be most helpful to have that you don't have today? So um, the determination of who an employee is is incredibly important. You have to be determined as an employee to actually be able to organize and, and have those rights. And then where Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren really stand apart in the labor plans um, that I think is critically important is um, a fulsome right to strike and the right to secondary strikes. Because what's happening right now, um, take the airline industry, for example. Uh, we have our, a local president who just got a first contract, uh, <laughs> jo Joanne, <laughs> Joanne Churchill here at GoJet. You know, in the, in the airline industry, the regional airlines do 45% of the domestic lift for the mainline carriers, United, uh, American, and Delta. And yet the workers at these regional airlines are paid 45% less because of the business model. Um, not because they're doing any different work. In fact, in many cases, they're doing harder work. They oftentimes have more uh, workers or more passengers that they're responsible for. Um, and so if you have the ability to have a secondary strike and to have a fulsome right to strike, we can't even get to the right to strike under the RLA today because it's held up by the administration. Um, then you can, actually, you can actually get to solutions because it, what people fail to realize is that a strike, in a strike, everyone has to consider what's at risk. There's something at risk for workers and there's something at risk for the corporations. And what it does is it simply in incentivizes everyone to get to common ground and to get to problem solving and to get to a deal. And um, so what Bernie and Elizabeth Warren are understanding here is that it's getting at that two-tiered system, contract work or however it may be described, to be able to say, no, we're not gonna undercut our jobs by allowing some of them to be contracted out, by allowing them to be defined as something less. We're gonna stand together and, and lift up all the jobs together. It's also um, really echoing what's happening in the country and this idea that Americans want solidarity. This is not about individual exceptionalism anymore. This is about understanding that we're all gonna do better when we all do better. Um, so um, those, those two things, really the AB5, but maybe fixed for the independent um, uh, writers, <laughs> and also um, the, the fulsome right to strike with the right to secondary strike, I think are the two most important um, provisions that would help to lift the standards of the country. One more quick thought. Yeah. So I, I think, uh, you know, past presidents have tried generally to be scrupulously neutral whenever there's an organizing drive or a strike. But I think things are so skewed now in favor of corporations. You know, corporate income as a share of national income is near record levels. Worker income is near lowest levels ever. Income inequality in the U.S. is worse than in any other industrial, you know, major industrial nation. Income inequality has increased over the past 15 years faster in the U.S. than any, any other industrial nation. You know, wages have been staggered. So I think, you know, if a president, you know, really wanted to help 
make things fairer, you know, maybe she or he or they would <laughs> you know, go on a picket line and, and say, you know, workers in the US are not getting a fair shake and I'm doing this to show that we have to make things fairer. All right, um, thank you guys. Co-sign. Um, <laughs> why, uh, why don't we open it up to some questions? about one third of your questions. <laughs> it's about right. Hi, it was good, it was good. Sense. Thank you both very much for coming and I, I've really enjoyed this. I was curious, continuing this section of the conversation surrounding labor law reform, um, because it just passed the House earlier this month. Do you think that the PRO Act is sufficient in terms of making organizing easier or are there additional steps that you'd like to see taken by a future Democratic president in Congress? Um. My view is the Pro, the PRO Act is fulsome. It doesn't get at all the workers in the country, so we also have to make sure that the um, public sector workers um, have similar labor law, um, and it's extended to workers like uh, working under the Railway Labor Act. Um, but it starts to get at the tenants that are necessary in order to have a, a more um, fair scale. I can be a pessimist. So <laughs> now just 6.2% of workers in the private sector, just one in 16, are in unions. And the private sector unions have really gotten very, very weak. Some have lost the memory muscle about how to do large-scale organizing. So even if the PRO Act is enacted, and I don't think Mitch McConnell's going to rush to enact it, uh, you know, it, it would have been much better for unions if a law like that were passed in the 1950s, 1670s, when one in three, you know, one in four workers were in unions. Now, unions really have to be very smart and strategic and, and vigorous to try to, to turn things around. But without the PRO Act, it would be very, you know, much, much harder mm -hmm. to turn things around. Thank you. Yeah, this is, uh, so this is something I think all three of us have talked amongst ourselves about before, but um, maybe it's worth making explicit. Like, how much do you think that the labor movement has lost this organizing mentality um, that would make you know that would make it possible to take advantage of, of tools like the Pro Act? I mean, how much does that exist? How much is it just you know as you say, there's this period of decades in which labor leaders just kind of decided that the best way to advance the agenda was to get in a room with you know sympathetic politicians and cut a deal, which is very different from an organizing mindset. You know, are we, do we have to sort of train a whole new generation of labor leaders to have that organizing mindset before we can capitalize on stuff like that? I think it's happening. And I think that um, the, the only roadblock here is um, not making sure that we've got uh, equal representation in our unions. So take, for example, let's just think about this. Um, a lot of times we're not getting at the issues that workers care about because we don't have the people in the room who are helping to uh, set the agenda and bring those conversations together. So just imagine if you had a president of the AFL-CIO who was a woman, and the majority of the AFL-CIO executive council was made up of women, and they passed a resolution to form a men's committee so that we could deal with the issues that men deal with at work. Um, <laughs> you start to get more, the idea. More, more bathroom stalls. Yeah. You, 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 <laughs> but you start to get the idea that the way that we're really going to change the labor movement is to make sure that we are taking on six, sexism and racism as our top priority. Because if we don't do that and we don't get more people in the room and help people understand that the labor movement is a place for everyone, then we're going to continue to organize in the sum of hundreds as opposed to millions like we should be. Um, so it's, to me, that is the most important thing that needs to happen. And I think that what's happening right now is that um, people are demanding that. And people are going out and taking it. And young workers are demanding that we have a vibrant intersectional labor movement um, that has um, a seat for everyone at the table. So as, as soon as we have that and we really, people understand that this is a place for everyone and this is a place for solidarity and that's how we're gonna do better together, um, I think that we can move forward. And I don't, I don't wanna dismiss the labor leaders who have kept this engine running in an incredibly difficult time with everything stacked against them. Um, because, and I don't want to dismiss the fact that they decided to go into rooms and try to get deals that would make things a little bit better for people. There, you know, the intent there was to make things better for people. But we're in a moment here where we can really capitalize on the energy that's taking place and organize in the millions, and we have to do that by making sure, first and foremost, that this is a place where every worker is welcome. So, just, just adding very quickly. So, 
I agree with what Sarah said. You know, there is a lot of energy, and the labor movement you know, has to figure out how to really capitalize on all this terrific energy and bring it to scale, and that's not easy. And there's some unions that are do doing a very good job organizing, but to really turn around the union movement, it has to be tripled and quadrupled. Mm -hmm. and, and I can't emphasize enough, the playing field is so tilted against workers when they try to unionize. It, it, you know, people don't begin to understand how <laughs> difficult it is. So you know, even when you know, smart union leaders say, we're gonna increase organizing here, there, and there, they can invest $2 million in these three organizing drives, but because things are so tilted in favor of management, it's hard. So the PRO Act would help, you know, help increase the chances of winning. So I, I was gonna avoid this question, but I feel like you set me up, which is, um, do you have any women in mind who might be good <laughs> candidates for, for running the AFL? Uh, Mother, Mother Jones? No. <laughs> Definitely Mother Jones, um, or at least her spirit, yeah. Okay, I, couldn't, I, had, to, I had to go there. <laughs> all right, next up. Uh, thank you all for coming, and thanks for the uh, shout outs to Campus Unions. Um, uh, so there's been a lot of uh, calls recently for uh, labor groups and environment groups to work together more and understand each other more, but um, there's a bit of an asymmetry in that uh, unions, for all their problems, have at least some uh, level of accountability to masses of workers, whereas environmental groups are mostly accountable to um, self-selected activists and you know, wealthy donors sometimes. Um, so I, I was wondering like, what prospects do you see um, to, for labor to um, take the lead in, in kind of defining a Green New Deal that works, um, uh, that's kind of like for and by uh, the working class? Yeah. It's gonna have to happen in the union halls. So, um, for example, um, some people would say that uh, Green New Deal or um, environmentalists who are pushing for environment, environmental reform would say stop all air travel. Well, that's sort of absurd, frankly. But um, it's, it, those talking points are also set up to try to pit workers against the environmental movement. When the reality is that if you just take our experience as flight attendants, for example, um, we are getting thrown around the cabin more than ever before because the change in air currents with the change in, uh, with climate change mm. is creating more um, clear air turbulence, which is a very, very serious um, occupational hazard. And then we see also that um, we have flights that are canceled um, to cities for months at a time where we're losing work because there's been a major disaster. Um, we know that at a certain point, the tarmac gets too hot to land on or take off. So the real threat um, to our jobs is not the solutions to climate change, it's climate change itself. Um, and the way to make change is to clearly define the problem. So if we can all get on the same page, that we're gonna trust science, and this is a problem that we have to solve, then in our union halls we can come up with those solutions because we can not only bring people together who, like I said, come from all these different backgrounds and different beliefs and different poli uh, political systems, trust me, the Chicago teachers, when they struck, they were not all far lefty Democrats supporting Bernie Sanders. There were plenty of Trump voters who were out there on the picket line because they had a common cause on the picket line. So in our union halls, we can bring people together and clearly define the problem, agree that there's a problem, and then set the solution forward that's going to be good for workers and not just good for a few billionaires who, if their experiment doesn't work out, they have a plan to go to live on the moon. So, um, yeah, so this has to happen in the union halls. It has to happen with labor. And it starts with really agreeing to define the solution, to set uh, the agenda for the solutions, and then to take the action, because you're all in on what the problem is and what you're willing to do to fix it in order to get results. And that will create the political will to get it done as well. So in my view, this has to start in the union halls. I, I agree it has to start in union halls. However, so when, <laughs> when, when AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, first, when her Green New Deal first leaked out, it wasn't really fin a finished product yet. And people forget there was already very bad blood between labor and the environmentalists over the pipeline fights. So uh, when the Green New Deal leaked out and there was talk of you know, closing coal mines and closing coal-fired power plants and co closed natural gas-fired power plants, all these union members thought, you know, this totally shows contempt for us. It's, it's not concerned that you know, thousands or tens of thousands of union members might lose their jobs. So they were angry. And my sense is they got too angry 
but partly because they were already mad over the pipeline stuff. So it would have been better if Nancy Pelosi or Richard Trumka or the head of the Environmental Defense Fund or whatever said, you know, instead of you know, scratching each other's eyes out, let's sit down and figure out a way to promote sustainable energy, promote a Green New Deal, and, and protect jobs as best we can. And, and the best thing I've seen on that is actually Bernie Sanders' Green New Deal. Because mm -hmm. he says, you know, he says uh, as we move towards sustainable energy, any time a fossil fuel related job is lost, that worker should get five years of pay, five years of pension credit with Medicare for all. That person won't have to worry about losing health coverage and get all the education she or he needs mm -hmm. moving forward. And I think that would go far to make environmentalists happy and make workers happy. You don't think we should just get miners to learn code? <laughs> <laughs> just, just check. Oh, OK. Go ahead. Hi. So another question about the possible alignment or misalignment of incentives between um, specific unions and broader progressive movements. So you want the labor union to be a big tent. Is there room in this tent for uh, unions like um, police unions or um, prison guard unions whose incentives are at least widely perceived to be imperfectly aligned with a lot of progressive groups? Right. So, or, we, you know, if we want to be crass about it, if you're looking across the labor movement and trying to identify pockets that were overwhelmingly Trump or much more disproportionately inclined to vote for Trump, the, some of those would be those that he named. So, you know, we have a, a flight attendant who ended up in um, six weeks of ICE detention this past year. Um, and she was a flight attendant flying for Mesa Airlines. Um, she was assigned a trip to Mexico. She was a DACA recipient. Um, and uh, because of the uh, executive order from the White House and then the court um, uh, reinstating DACA, um, there was a provision that was left out, which was the ability to work in and outside of the country as a DACA recipient. So um, she got caught in this moment where she was on probation with um, uh, the job she'd always dreamed of having after going to Texas A&M and growing up in this country, and she's assigned this trip to Monterey, Mexico, and she goes to her supervisor and says, I can't go, I don't, I don't think I can go, and her supervisor says, no, I've checked all the regulations and you can definitely go, and when she comes back, um, she is um, taken by uh, CBP and um, ha put in a 24-hour tank and then sent off to a private prison um, that, um, uh, that ICE was running. So she talks about this experience. When we found out about this, we got her out within 18 hours and um, mobilized to do that. But she talks about this experience and she talks about the fact that the uh, workers there running the prison had been told that they were getting a job in a community where there were no jobs, and they were going to get a job um, that was going to give them minimum wage and health care and some, some other benefits, right? And they were told that they were going to be prison guards. And then they showed up and find out that actually what they're doing is they are guarding um, these uh, detainees. And so they had no idea that was going to happen, but they've been through training. Now they have to provide for their families. They're there. They are understaffed. She says the place was a mess. It wasn't cleaned up. The food was terrible. They were given terrible treatment. But she remembers talking with a guard who talked about this experience about being hired and then not being given the resources to do the job herself and getting frustrated and frustrating with the, the people that she's guarding who are uh, you know, saying that the conditions are horrible and it's setting up this conflict between the, the worker who's been hired and the person that they are policing, right? And so I think that it's, it's really important that um, we recognize that the people who are uh, creating this conflict and, and pushing people together into this conflict are the ones to blame, not the people who are looking for a job and trying to provide for their families. We cannot think of other people as the problem. And I always tell people, the minute that you start thinking they about another worker, that's the union buster at work. So I, I, I think that we have to be really careful about saying that some workers deserve a union and others don't. Because if you have good unions that are doing their job and are calling out the problems at work, 
You usually will not have the kind of abuses of other people or the poor safety and health practices that are in place if you have unions that are working and if you are promoting the idea that those unions are there to take care of each other and there is the idea of solidarity. So if we can promote that, I don't think that there are certain jobs that you can classify as uh, that are workers' jobs that are not allowed to have the same ability to be a part of a labor movement. Adding one or two thoughts. So uh, over the past few days, it's come out that Donald Trump has signed a memo that would give uh, Defense Secretary Espy a green light to yeah. take away bargaining rights for 750,000 defense de civilian Defense Department employees because they see you know, unions as getting in the way of national security, as reducing the flexibility. And I'm sure many of us would say, of course these workers should have bargaining rights. Mm -hmm. uh, every worker should. But you know, clearly, some Republicans disagree. Now, the gentleman who asked this question, um, you know, if you were the president of a police union, and I know a lot of us are unhappy with how the police union, the CBD, handled the Quan McDonald case. You know, but you know, if you were the head of the union and one of and several of your people are accused, you know, you have a fiduciary duty, you know, like it or not, to like go to bat for your people. And if you say, you know, that member screwed up, really acted badly, and, and you know, he should be fired, you know, you're gonna get a lot of grief from people that's, who say you're not fulfilling your fiduciary duty. And, and it's a very complicated thing, and as a result, a lot of police union members, uh, police union officials and correction officers officials go to bat for people that many of us think did, did something wrong. And it's just not an easy issue, but I would argue that they, like you, you know, should have the right to have a union. Yeah, I have to say, I, I'm always struck, um, uh, you know, when I report on an issue that is not, um, that sort of transcends a partisan alignment, where you see solidarity in all kinds of unexpected places. And uh, the example that comes to my mind most recently, maybe not most recently, but most prominently was the, um, the right to work ballot initiative in Missouri. When was that, in 18, summer mm -hmm, of 18? 18. Mm -hmm. and I talked to um, you know, a number of um, incredibly conservative, politically conservative uh, union members in Missouri who were like diehard Trump voters. And these people were you know, lining up, they were bringing their neighbors to the poll to oppose this ballot initiative. And so you, 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 see, you, know, you see all kinds of examples where worker solidarity can transcend these partisan divides. And so it's, it's, um, you know, it's, uh, it's seductive but wrong to assume that people are basically a function of, of, of how they vote. Um. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ugo Kere. I am the policy director for Raise the Floor Alliance, which is an organization that uh, represents primarily uh, the most marginalized workers in society, folks we can generally consider as invisible. These are folks who work as uh, domestic worker, workers, day laborers, and um, restaurant workers, things of that nature. And these are all non-unionized employees. Uh, and so, you know, I wanted to ask, you know, so Just Cause, um, for folks who don't know, Just Cause is Just Cause for Termination. Um, basically, uh, it's a provision in union contracts that says that you're not at will. There has to be a reason for firing you. Um, you know, just cause is starting to be a national conversation, mm -hmm. um, but sometimes folks will say things like, you know, if you give everybody just cause, that, uh, you know, why would anyone want to join a union? Uh, so I have a question for Sarah and for you as well, uh, Steve. You know, in your opinion, is it uh, should we have just cause across the country for every single worker, or is this something that is going to be a detriment to unions? Definitely we should have just cause across the country, okay? And if anybody says that that is a detriment to unions, then they don't understand how this works. Because if you actually have workers have the ability to understand that if they stand up to their employer, they're not just going to be uh, gotten rid of without some sort of process, then you have a better ability to actually organize and have people have the feeling that they can stand up and stand up for themselves. So there's always going to be something to organize around, always whether it's shoes that flight attendants wear. There's always something that, that you're gonna be able to organize around in a workplace. And anybody who says that we should diminish those rights and you should only have those rights if you can pass all these hurdles to get a union, that you should have those rights, 
it doesn't understand how this works. Because using power builds power. When workers feel that they have power, they're going to use it more. And they're, going to, and they're going to demand more. And they're going to be more willing to join together and take that and have demands of their employer. So we should have just cause across the country. Just, just adding a few sentences. So we as a nation are an at-will employment nation, meaning employers can fire you for anything except you know, legislatively you know, specific things like race or religion or age. Uh, so if you come into work one day and, and burp or don't smile or, or say something that you don't like your boss's shoes, you can be fired. So I think a lot of people feel that if we have just cause, meaning you could only be fired for just cause and there'd be some type of hearing you know, when you're fired, that would embolden workers to, that would give workers more of a voice at work. It would embolden them to speak up. And you know, as Sarah said, that would encourage more collective action to improve the lot of workers. Hi there. Um, first thing I want to say is I'd love to see a woman as the AFL-CIO leader. Yeah. Um, I think it would solve a lot of problems and right now. From Greta to the Women's March, this is leadership proof, organizing proof. They're the ones that are stepping up. So also having said that, what I've heard here today is um, on one side of me, painfully predictable. On the other side, I have hope that we can evolve. So are we setting up another generation for failure? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> no. Um, I, you know, um, thank you for your comments and also for uh, what you turned into a question. Um, <laughs> that um, what's, what's different here and what I believe is going to make the difference in this election in 2020 is that whether we actually elect a woman as president, it is going to be women who lead the way in this election. And uh, there are women who are stepping up who have gotten elected. We have seen um, a greater uh, percentage of women leading. If you look at Nevada, across the board, it is majority women in leadership positions now. Um, and that, that change is going to lead to the idea that someone who, uh, that these people who have been in leadership positions all this time for decades and decades, some of them running for president right now, have not pushed for equal rights for women in this country, it is going to change the paradigm. The fact that women are stepping forward, taking these leadership positions, and being a part of the conversation is going to change what the next generation feels. Progress is not linear. It runs, uh, it, it, it runs in circles. Okay, and so we made some progress by having the first um, African American president of the United States, and then we took a big step backwards. But we're about to take another step further that takes us further again. So I really believe we're on the cusp of making some, you know, major changes going forward and, and major step forward. And I think that the people that are getting involved right now and being a part of that um, are are going to feel some real wins. I also think that. We have to recognize that as much as we are setting out really big aspirational goals, that there is going to be some heartbreak along the way for some people because um, progress is also, also comes in steps. And so there are going to be incremental steps that are taken forward, but it's going to be because we have these aspirational goals of moving forward. In, in, in ways, this is the worst of times and the best of times. I and, think and we're having the wrong conversations, but and a blue government's not going to solve it. I, I'm not saying that. So, you know, we, we've Correct. seen the Women's March, the Me Too March, Black Lives Matter, the Climate Marchers, the, the March for Our Lives. Uh, people are really energized in a way we haven't seen in decades. Yep. And, and the question is whether that could somehow be translated into effective power to, you know, you know to lift the younger generation. And, and you know, so in my book I write about, you know, by four to one, five to one, six to one margins, Americans support a higher minimum wage, paid sick days law, paid vacation law, and it ain't going anywhere. And, and you know, just as we have a government now that's, you know, crapping all over the idea of doing anything about climate change, I think corporate power, our very broken finance, uh, campaign finance system, make, you know, that's what's really blocking all this progressive energy to create a fairer country. And there's this tug of war and I think a lot of us hope, you know, you know, Greta Thunberg's side wins and not, not Donald Trump and, and Exxon. So 
it's, you know, I, I, I hope things get better, but I can't promise. <laughs> go ahead. I'm going to go out on a limb and promise it, OK? <laughs> <laughs> no, I really believe it. I believe it. I want you to hear that. I, I, I know it. I know it. I know it in my heart. I see it. I see the energy building. I see people stepping forward who have never stepped forward before. And every time someone does, somebody else says, I can do it too. And that's what we're setting up here, and that is what's going to lead to real change. And I think we're going to see it. Hi, I'm a young person. I'm in a union and like, very few of my friends are, and it's hard to advocate for, you know, people who, like you said, are they're young professionals, the Democrats and stuff, and like why they're good. And I'm also kind of alienated from my own union because it's enormous, and <laughs> I don't like what the people. I mean, it's SEIU. <laughs> I don't like, you know, how they do things and how do you advocate among other people? You know, sell them on stuff that this is good, and, and I'm struggling. How do you? How do I? you know, make changes in my own thing, because it's kind of like a, a government itself is huge, and, you know, it, it's run kind of like an, an old corporation, and I don't, <laughs> you know, like, I've been a member a long time, and um, I, I didn't I didn't like the stuff that Andy Sterling was doing, <laughs> or any like that, to say, so I'm struggling how to, how, do you, how to navigate that. So read your union's constitution, and get involved, and get more involved. And the, the truth is that democracy uh, doesn't work when people don't participate. When we just hand over our power to other people to make decisions, it doesn't work. Um, and so democracy is really messy. And calling it out and um, being a dissident is the best way that you can love your union. But love your union and understand that there is a purpose for an institution. Because if you don't have that institution, you don't have the legal rights that you have with that institution, and you don't have the framework to make change. Think about your union as the framework to make change, and love it for that reason. And when you call it out, and when you say that you know, these are things that we have to fix, that is the best way that you can possibly love your union. Um, just one, one thing, just to point back to Steve's book, um, you, you, you grapple with this issue of union democracy a little bit in the book. You have one interesting idea for term limits for uh, union leadership. Do you want to just sort of elaborate on what the kind of your platonic ideal of a democratic union would be and how we get there? So, so, so very quickly, uh, yeah. you know, there are union leaders you know, who had unions for 20, 30 years when the unions are shrinking, when they don't win good contracts, it's very hard for... Uh, you know, people to, to challenge them and win. So I say maybe there should be term limits of say, you know, two four year terms, you know, especially if your union isn't growing, if a union, you know, and maybe, you know, uh, there can be a referendum where you need two thirds or three quarters support to, you know, to stay in power. And I also say that, you know, to, you know, University of Chicago School of Economics is all about incentives. A lot of union leaders don't have any <laughs> incentives to do organizing. You know, they might spend five hundred thousand or a million dollars on a campaign, and 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 lose that campaign fifty one percent to forty nine percent. And their members will say, you know, why did you do that? Why did you waste my money? So, you know, I say one thing that unions might do is you know give union leaders a bonus if they organize ten thousand workers and cut their pay by five percent if their union membership cuts by you know drops by five percent. You know, incentives, I don't agree with the Chicago School of Economics on everything, but, <laughs> but uh, incentives can really maybe help move union leaders to do more to build the movement. I think we have time for maybe one, one two questions. Two questions. This is Roberta. I wasn't going to come to the mic because I thought I was the older person in the room, I should stand back. But when I saw not, 10 not guys, that old, when I not saw that old. Steve, Steve, when I, saw, <laughs> when I saw 10 guys rush to the mic, I felt I should advance the yeah! cause of women right here tonight <laughs> by getting to the mic. Um, so let me just uh, say a couple things briefly. One, uh, Steve, you, I, I think all of you have stressed. Introduce yourself. Well, why? Nobody else did. <laughs> uh, but uh, so. You know, you made a very important point about how radically the playing field is tilted when workers try to organize. And I just wanted to add to that the incredible courage. Everybody was talking about the energy, and it's there, mm -hmm. and it's great. 
But workers get fired when they try to organize. We had a human service agency mm -hmm. helping people on the west side of Chicago fire workers when they tried to organize. We have a hospital where people are trying to organize. People get fired when they try to organize, and that scares everybody else. And if you have a job that's marginal and your family counts on it, that's a very scary thing. And that's what happens to workers in this country today yep. when they try to organize. And that's why it's amazing, absolutely amazing, that workers do still organize in this climate. And it shows us what could be done if we had decent, fair labor laws in this country. So that, and then I want to say from that, that uh, Noam asked the question about what could be done, and you guys both gave great answers. But there's two things, and honestly, no, it feels like fantasy land to talk about what could be done if the Democrats got control of Congress in both houses and a presidency. But since you asked the question, I will answer it, which is that the <laughs> two Mr. things that were not school. mentioned, yeah. one is that what a lot of people don't realize, in Illinois, half a million uh, workers are public workers, teachers, uh, social workers, sanitation workers. There are 30 states in this country where public sector workers do not have the right to bargain. Teachers in West Virginia had to stage that strike because they went 10 years without a pay raise because they don't have a union day in and day out to fight for them. Mm -hmm. So we can, ha can and must pass a national law granting every public sector worker in this country collective bargaining rights. That, that will grow the labor movement exponentially larger than anyone could begin to imagine right now. And secondly, we need a national law banning state right to work laws. In other words, reverse the Taft-Hartley Act. So, so just, to follow up, just to follow up very quickly, uh, Robert, I write about that in the book. I write about a, 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 home, a nursing home worker in Florida who led a unionization drive in West Palm Beach. He was fired for supposedly trying to strangle a patient. Uh, it took six years of litigation, probably that cost probably tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars to get him reinstated. His name is Ernst Duval. He, you know, the, you know, the federal appeals courts finally ordered him back to work. By then, the unionization drive had totally fizzled. And, and all the back pay he got, there was no finally back pay of $1,305. So that was not even a slap on the wrist, because he had found another job as a translator for Catholic Charities. You know, he spoke like three, four different languages. The courts found it was total BS that he tried strangling anyone. And, and you know, the labor law is so broken that companies can, with impunity, mm -hmm. fire pro-union workers. And the penalties are low because you subtract any future wages they earn after they're fired. So that's why after <laughs> six years uh, for, that it took to reinstate him, the company had, had to pay hardly anything. And that shows that the playing field is really skewed badly. Yeah. Uh, la last question. Hi. So um, if someone were to be, let's say, skeptical of uh, kind of current government and its ability to get new policies enacted, uh, even with the 2020 candidate hopefuls having great plans, getting through Senate or Supreme Court or any of the other potential like limitations, I would, I'm curious what ideas some new energized leader at the AFL-CIO could bring <laughs> to potentially reforms within the labor movement or supporting sort of new initiatives, alt-labor, new innovations, and things that could be done specifically to improve the current labor movement outside of policy or trusting anything in government. Yeah. <laughs> so, so first and foremost, it can't be about thinking that this election is going to change anything. Because if we haven't learned that by now, um, there is no savior coming. Um, we, it, it doesn't matter who we elect. If we don't have an engaged labor movement that is actually pushing these things and demanding it of the representatives, then there's no reason for them to put in place good policy. So there has to be an energized labor movement all the time um, to, be, to make sure that we actually get the policy that we need, no matter who we elect. All you're doing when electing someone is maybe you're having a better ear. Um, but you still have to force the political will to make the change. So um, we are, we're, I think we're out of time. But um, there, has to be, there has to be an engaged labor movement. And we just simply, let me, let me start here, OK? We cannot spend all of our union dollars on elections. 
We have to spend our union dollars on organizing because if we are not doing what I said before, that Mother Jones said, that you must fight. There must always be a fight. You're fighting for someone. That is not to be at odds with anyone. That is to show people that you love them because you're willing to fight for them. And on that note too, I should just say that we should fight forward with our emotions for each other because emotions are not a detriment to us. Emotions are our superpower because it means that we're gonna fight like hell for the people that we love. So we, we, we have got to have a labor movement that is constantly organizing and put our dollars into that organizing and that will naturally change the political outcome. Thank, thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you to our you. terrific panelists. Thanks, Steve, Mr. Moderator. Thank you for the, the, uh, the terrific book. Yes. Thank you. Uh,